I'm with uh, Omar Willie from Seattle. So tell us Hello. a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm from Seattle, like you say, um, and one of those qualities, I suppose, that goes along with that is I publish a magazine from Seattle called the Seattle Star Online. It's been, oh goodness, 11 years now. I've been doing that and uh, my experiment in Creative Commons publishing and trying to make the world a little more interesting, as it were, and see how much we can actually get done within a gift economy, sharing culture, and try to change journalism back to actually serving people and something like, you know, Harper's or Atlantic way, way back in the late 19th century used to do to get away from the 250 word blurb that's always written by advertisers. So that's what started it. And that's what got me really thinking heavily about Creative Commons way back in 2010 or so. Tell me a bit about what is that label day as it will. That's a very good question because everyone asks me the same thing. Um, I tell them that it's sort of an online version of record store day where there's an awful lot of music that gets released that day under creative commons or other free licenses and uh i refer to it sort of as the anti-spotify you know an okay. attempt to get people back to listening to music that they control and that more importantly that they can share and discover for themselves and, and encourage other people to discover it's been going since 2015 i came in at the tail end of that as a as a listener um 2016 things got really really big for it where there were a lot more <coughs> live broadcasts and podcasts to go along with it including your own in fact um, which started before that but that's when everybody kind of took notice of it and it ballooned a little bit and of course the pandemic made it uh, deflate a little bit and um, because Manuel uh, Silva was the was the guy that put it together he's, he's sitting down his MIST label I didn't actually realize he was doing that Mm. Yeah, he's been closing down and he threatened to shut down Net Label Day entirely. And I said, no, that's not a thing, Manuel. So I <laughs> told him that I would take over for him. What are you hoping to achieve this year? Well, this year is sort of a holding pattern, I think. Uh, I've only been really in charge of it since February, March ish. I want to make sure that we get back to some live broadcasts, a little bit of a little bit of a concert going, perhaps even live stream concerts and things like that, that hold the event together. And then next year, um, I will probably pull out the stops a bit on the organ. Okay, so the, the live component, do you see that as like a, a continuous stream that we could all, all, you know, connect into at some point? And then we could all, you know, one, one place we could go to, and you can listen to perhaps myself talking for a few hours and then somebody else and then eventually come over to you. That is how I envision it. Whether or not it will actually play out that way is another story. My ideal situation would be we'd start at the international dateline in Auckland, yeah. Wellington, New Zealand time. And then we have something that continues to pass on all the way through the other side of the IDL at uh, Alaska, Hawaii, or, you know, the Cook Islands, if you're that far out. Yeah, I can imagine that being... Um... Uh, quite hectic, but but fun. Uh, but you know that's all part of it. That's the that's the important thing. And and another thing you you particularly want to get you know, I think uh, involved in is is getting people to use Creative Commons licenses because there's an awful lot of people out there that give away their music for free on on Bandcamp or wherever and great sites like that. But they they they, they stick it with a normal copyright and you you don't want to do that you want to persuade other people to do that tell me more about that why obviously one of the reasons is because creative commons itself is important to me other you know there's the shirt yeah. <laughs> so there there is that but more importantly i think one of the things that i've been encountering as i talk to people who used to be involved in net label day and haven't been for three four years they were insisting well net label day doesn't really matter anymore because big studios release things online now and net labels release physical media so the lines are very blurry and i thought if we're going to take that seriously then what we have to do is redefine net label day mm -hmm. to be completely distinct in that sense from the studios and cons and i think concentrating on the creative commons license and sharing is absolutely the key to that to anybody that's, n that's not really been you know aware of what a, what a creative commons license means why on earth will you do it there are times as a musician where you need to consider your actual relationship to music and your actual relationship to your listener and one of the things that creative commons does is it cuts out the commercial aspect of it we've sort of built a music industry that's built around scarcity 
because it was expensive, extremely expensive once upon a time, where only a few people could have record presses and only a few people could actually make albums. And that was a, a relic of the analog world that <coughs> we rather inherited. Well, now we have an analog scarcity mentality in a world where digital pressing is instantaneous and instant and extremely low overhead, and it's not expensive whatsoever for musicians themselves to release their own music. And so that particular commercial component that drove the overhead of that industry is now gone. So musicians found themselves thinking, well, I could just go straight to my crowd and not have to go through A&R people. On that level, I think it became very important to come up with a different way of doing things and to mark the music that was being done in that particular way as music that was made specifically for fans rather than for a commercial setting as such, where you would only encounter things through marketplace. The Creative Commons license, what it does is it puts a label effectively on your music that says, hi, I'm here. I want to share something with you. And I want my music also to be shared from you to other people. And I want this to be legal because I think we all still need to respect the law. And if you follow these terms, whatever those terms happen to be, then fine. And that allows the listener a lot more control over their musical experience, but it also allows very basic things like mixtapes to be made legally rather than sort of sublegally or in that bizarre zone that we like to call fair dealing, fair use, depending on the, on the country and, or the culture that you're in. Because officially those things are illegal and have been prosecuted brutally and relentlessly by the MPAA, RIAA and their lawyers. And Creative Commons takes music out of that zone and says, hi, I'm made to be shared. I don't care about what you do with this, as long as you obey my terms, and it's for you, not for me. It's for you and to restore your relationship with me, I think. Is it that artists, you know, feel that they have to brand, you know, a piece of work as their own? And they, right. they, 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 they just assume that the best way to do it is with a, with a, with a, with a, with a classic copyright. You know, I made this, it's mine. Right. Um, I, I know I'm going to give it away for free. Uh, but maybe in some point in the future, I'll, I'll, I'll get some money out of it. Is right. that why they're doing it? Oh, I think that's a, an amazingly large part of why they do it. I think right. there's a sort of speculative capitalism that's built into almost everything these days because we get uh, nonsensical stories like um, people becoming millionaires off of NFTs and things like that completely mm. on a fluke. And somebody then decides, well, whatever I make might also make money on a fluke. So yeah. I have to retain total control over that because I don't want anybody making money that I didn't approve of. Mm. I think there's another piece of that, which uh, Marilyn and I were talking about, Marilyn from Volpiano Records, which is that artists want to choose their fans in a sense, and they want to choose the views that they align with and the uses of their music saying that you have a firm copyright all rights reserve hold on your music allows you to sort of control who uses it and under what purposes because written permission has to be sought at every single moment but i think there's also an alternative to that where you can align your views with whomever simply because people are more capable of finding you with a Creative Commons license because your music is shared and because your music is shared by like-minded people. I think mm. that overcomes that sizably. Let's, let's come back to Net Label Day. Uh, the first thing that I did when I took over Net Label Day was to think, okay, how do we get people who have sort of lost faith, as it were, back into the fold? And what can I offer to them that is new in a sense, but also revitalizes them and reconnects them with the reason they got involved with Net Label Day in the first place. And I think part of that was, I just simply had to come up with something very strongly visual that was noticeable. So the logo and the brand on that level was extremely important to me. And it's also important because since it's a Creative Commons based event in many ways, uh, sharing is important and sharing needs to carry sort of a brand with it so that it doesn't get lost. And <clears throat> the new Net Label Day logos are sort of markers for things like that. And of course, the other piece of that is the social media component. 
where there are banners that have to be done and avatars that have to be done so that people see the same logo over and over and over so that they can associate that with Net Label Day. That was sort of very fundamental groundwork for me. From the point of view of distribution, uh, I think we've drifted away from the Internet Archive probably a little too much, and we relied on it early on and the first two years of uh, net label day everything on that label day is up on the internet archive and labeled as such as being part of net label day 2015 or 2016 that hasn't happened in the past four years you have to know that links are going to rot and therefore there has to be a much more archival library like place for releases otherwise they simply disappear into the ether now that may be what you want by design but um if it's part of the event i want the design not to be that way necessarily i want the right. event to have a continuous history so what can anybody watching this or you know heard about net label day what could they do to help well share music is the first one okay uh, that's the most important thing in the world uh you know, you and can label it as, as shared music to do with precisely the day 2021, 22. Or that. Um, okay. Yeah, it's it's back to uh, you know, Tim O'Reilly's thing that the artist these days has more to fear from obscure, obscurity than he does from piracy, right? And I think that that's a very strong driving force in this. There's so much music and so much photography and so much visual art that is available to us that it seems like it's all free when in fact it isn't. It's locked up in various ways and it's controlled in various ways. Now, just because someone doesn't come to you immediately and exercise that control doesn't mean that they won't. And that's the downside of, of the all rights reserved ways. Like, well, somebody may just decide to delete your book remotely, which of course Amazon has done with Hatchet and various other things. Uh, they may decide that you no longer have the right to that track to put it in to a music video of yours. You may no longer have the right even to play that track while your baby is dancing in the background because lo and behold, it's been bought by a new company. So marking your music as freely shareable and uh, <coughs> Creative Commons or Libre in, in any sense, that's extremely important. Uh, I think it's even more important for artists to insist on that amongst each other because the education about the Creative Commons and sharing licenses is so weak in so many ways. Um, as a fan, I think it's good at times to put together playlists and mixtapes and go, hey, this is what I'm interested in. This is my particular curatorial thing, because those things are never, ever, ever going to come up randomly on Spotify or any one of the commercial services because the algorithms don't bend that way. Algorithms don't tell you things that you're going to be interested in based on no data. They only are based on the data that they have, which of course is bought and sold before it even gets to you. So as a fan, I think it's important to distribute things that way also. There, there is an importance by the sound of what you're saying that, that you you want to, you really want to make this as, as, as something different. And I, I think that's kind of interesting because mm -hmm. I, I get the impression that most artists don't see it that way necessarily. There mm -hmm. may be an, a bunch of artists that do see it that way and they're all of the same um, shared vision as yourself. Um, what would you say to somebody who was just starting up as a, as a, as a musician and you know, they have a choice? Where would, the, where, would, where would you recommend they go and why? At the beginning of one's career, I think that everything should be as freely shared as possible. Um, and I've held to that myself as an artist. I don't think that as you get to be more experienced as an artist, I think that you find different ways of making money from your art. Net Label Day is not about not getting artists paid. The Creative Commons is not about not getting artists paid. The Creative Commons is not there to tell you that you don't have the right to earn a living or that you don't have the right to live and exist, in fact. There's an entire book of Creative Commons strategies for making money off of your Creative Commons licensed work that's out there. And that's only one obvious instance of it. But the first thing as an artist that you have to do is you have to get your name out there if you want to make any money, period. And then once your name is out there, that becomes the coin in a sense that you trade. 
to get your to get your reputation established. And the more established your reputation, the more likely you are to make money. And the commons is actually an, ex, an excellent way to do that, much, much better than locking your work down and making sure that people don't have access to it unless they write you personally. Is there any questions I perhaps I should have asked you, but I, I feel like I don't. <laughs> One of the things I find fascinating is this quote unquote rediscovery of podcasting that seems to have happened over the last three or four years, right? And sure. you guys like yourself and Dave are magically then you've been left out of this sort of official history because podcasts clearly only began once Ira Glass started doing it, right? Or once people started hearing it on the BBC as an official exactly. word that was acceptable. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. But even though podcasting obviously has been around almost as long as uh, the Creative Commons itself has been around, as it turns out. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for your time, Omar. I will, uh, I will uh, keep my listeners and whoever watches this um, updated with any more information. But we are aiming for July the 14th. Yes, uh, indeed. At some point, um, was from somewhere between New Zealand and Hawaii, uh, there'll, <laughs> be a, there'll be a stream somewhere. We've just got to find it. So we've got to make sure we, we label it properly and you can right. find it. Um, and they can be involved. And uh, that will be a rather good thing, I think. So uh, thank you very much for your time. All righty.